Hello and welcome to The Collegium, our monthly magazine program in three parts. Cinema, State of Affairs, and our arts calendar. For our Cinema One presentation, we bring you A Look Towards the Sky, director Hadi Mohage from Iran, one of the films that will be screened during the 28th Black International Cinema, May 2012. Proceeding to Cinema Two, we have Tomlinson Hill, director Lisa Kaselek from the United States of America. State of Affairs is an article from the Democratic German Report, April 23, 1975, with research and an article regarding Mildred Harnack Fish. Research material from the 14th Black International Cinema Berlin Anthology, 1998-1999, courtesy of the Humboldt University. Last but not least, Cinema 3, a tribute to William Greaves, Ralph Bunch, and American Odyssey. So in addition to staying cool, remember you are participating in what else but the Collegium.
Beta, A mesilçi. A bari. Barikella, A mesilçi. A bari. Aferin, A mesilçi. A. A, abası da çeşit konuyor. A. Barikella, Barikella. B, B, B mesilçi. Ba ba. Aferin, B mesilçi. Ba ba. Aferin, mesle. Ba ba. Baran, Baran ne fayda eder? Aferin. Baran açtı duruz mu şevet? Aa! Aferin. Aferin. خدا یا ایما یه نون مونه بارون بزن یه آزکا مونه زندهی مونه دم رحمت ها بگوش بارون بزن بیزون هی پخیر هی دارا هی ای زبین او دلشی کو دم بارون ها بگوش بنا بخاطر خو خدا خدا رحم بکن خدا هرچی هر بده کنه و پای خوش بگره رحم مسلمونال بکو بارون بزن Sarıkoye bilendi feryadı çerdam Emir alimamini ne yadı çerdam Emir alimamini ne işah merdun Gile na şad ma na şad bıcardun دا سلام دا سلام نه خاصه بود دادم مردم و شرفتم و کوس سر چشمه او آوردم خاصه او بیام پاره من او بیام دا فهمه هم چکنم بی بورونی او تالال خوشک او بینه تال او سادن بورون هم نزه خوشک سولیه فهمه کاری کنم تمکنی بی هلوزیت چکنم برای دا او خدا که خدا هلازی سیمو کنم بورون بزن سی ای مردمی چشمه هل بچن او تالال یا خدا 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 خدا یا فتو یا سیلی وی ما نیکنی چرا مت بارون تبواری یا سیلی ما یا سیلی ما چند سال پیشه؟ بیس سال پیش چش بی؟ بارون نزای من منطقه من دمو توجه کشته چرا بدیه بارون داشت؟ بارون قولیت خدا ای توجه پی ای رفتی با یا 
يا خلا يا خلا بحق ايد السلطه شي جاه صايم خلا خلا تبارون بزان خلا خلا يقد اي زني تبتاش مرده يجري يا خلا يا خلا يا باروني بزان يا فرد يا فرد اسم بزور جيت حمد ما انا ازي غام درد يا خلا ماما درو بو درو آتش اخو برای کوا میخوام برام شهر بنزین بزنم و دوالی هم سی زینب یارو هم نیا من نیا تبره در موزاده نه نه تبیه سیونه به تابیه بیو بو بو اخش بفهم بیو سیکو ایتیاد که بو بار چلا دفتر نقاشی و کلم رنج سی تیارو امامزاده من نرشلم اجر دندو نام یک نی جندوم سی چبوتره لحضرت رضا بورم و خراسون دندون هم نهام یه دی سال خوش سالی هم شرمانده ی چبوتره لوم چی جندوم و جیرم نومه من روتی کنم تر روه خلاده تا یه چرامت بارونی بدمای یا الله یا الله
my great-great-grandfather was James Kendrick Tomlinson. He came from Alabama with 50 slaves and settled on Tomlinson Hill in 1859, giving the hill its name. Standing on the hill and looking at the historical plaque where it talks about J.K. Tomlinson establishing the slave plantation here and understanding what happened at that place. In reality, I was coming to terms with the fact that my ancestors were slaveholders and murderers and rapists. And I think if anyone who kind of realized that their ancestors had committed crimes like that, that's the kind of weight that I felt when I was on Tomlinson Hill for the first time. I know what happens on a slave plantation. You know, I know what's necessary to maintain that kind of power. And looking out and seeing the poverty in which the descendants of, the black descendants of the hill lived in, you know, that was done by my family. One of, the, one of the reasons why I've chosen to be a journalist, and particularly to be a war correspondent, is because I believe in the need to have someone bear witness. I've covered nine wars over the last 14 years. You know, I've been shot at, blown up, sniped, mortared, hit by artillery shells. I mean, whatever you can imagine, I've experienced in war on the front lines. And I did those things because I believed in the necessity of someone witnessing and reporting. That feeling I had on that hill was much the same. And I don't think we've really come to terms, particularly in my generation and younger, we're becoming so distant from the realities of pre-civil rights America. We need to bear witness to this part of my life that I have a special connection to and hopefully bear witness to what happened on that hill and what happened to the people who lived on that hill. Most of the families that once lived on Tomlinson Hill now live in Marlin, just six miles away. My grandfather said to me, not only did we have a slave plantation, but there's black folks down there who have Tomlinson as their name, and we used to own them. When Ladanian was still playing football at TCU, my father goes, there's this football player named Ladanian Tomlinson from Marlin. And I kind of kept track of Ladane's career after that. And then the New York Times did the story about how Ladane traced back to Tomlinson Hill. So I set up a, a Google alert and I saw a message that Lori Ann was going to speak at the Marlin City Council.
bless this council and bless uh, every entity that is here today. Now we realize today we cannot do anything without you. And so we are leaning and we are depending on you for a change for our community and for our country. So we thank you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good evening, Mr. Mayor, and all the council members, and all the citizens of Marlin. I'm Lori Ann Tomlinson. I'm originally from Marlin, and um, I left Marlin to raise my, my family because there was actually little for my children to do here. But I want to come back home, and I don't want to come back the way it is. I want to work with the citizens of Marlin to build our town back where it was when I was growing up. We had over 9,000 people in Marlin then. So we want to do whatever it takes to get Marlin back where it was and even surpass that. We have been working a long time together and um, we are really getting things moving. And my son is on board with me and uh, with the church, with Pastor Garrett and his family and the church family. So we're just waiting to hear what we need to do. After the meeting was over, Lorianne was in the parking lot, and I decided, well, you know, I need to introduce myself. But what was I going to say? Oh, by the way, my ancestors used to own your ancestors, and as a result, we have the same last name? I didn't know how that was going to go over. And his father was James K., who was the one that brought 43 slaves from mm -hmm. Alabama in 1856 mm -hmm. to Tomlinson Hill. Uh -huh. So. O.T.'s brother was named James K. They, we call him J.K. He just yeah. he just died. He died right after T. did. Uh, not even a year ago. Wow. They they had named him James K. And everybody called him J.K. Tomlinson. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Of course, this was my first encounter with a black Tomlinson. And when I met Lori Ann, it seemed perfectly natural to her that she would meet a white Tomlinson. Because for her, growing up in Marlin and visiting Tomlinson Hill and seeing white Tomlinsons was a fact of life. It was normal. Slavery wasn't that long ago for them. It's still a fact of life, of their daily lives today. And they're resolved to it in a way that I wasn't. So I, while I was really nervous and, and worried about, you know, being cursed out and told to get lost, there was none of that. And she started calling me cousin, you know, brother, uh, my brother by another mother. You know. We were slaves, so we belonged to that family. When they became free, since they only had one name, they needed two. Then they took on their master's name. John Tomlinson stayed in the house. They knew O.T. because they, of course, knew him from when he was a kid. And they interacted like basically a distant families, you know, distant cousins or something. You know, when they saw one another, they were glad to see one another, always shook one another's hand. They asked about the other family member, da 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 da. OT was the caretaker of the hill. In the morning, he would get up and walk, and that, that uh, country dirt, you know, it was like sand. It was so soft. And everybody knew everybody. Everybody helped one another. Everybody uh, related to you and what you were going through. You could actually forget all of your troubles. The hill just made you feel that way. It just really did. And then you were surrounded by love, not only from family, but people that had been on the hill forever. They were like family. When you look through this area out here, you can see that it's that it's elevated more than other areas, which when the Tomlinsons came and, and settled in this area, it just it became known as 
Tomlinson Hill. It was right over that hill, there was a big oak tree where they called all the slaves around and read the Emancipation Proclamation. That's why this area was donated here by the Tomlinson family, so it could be a reunion ground. And it's a reunion ground that's used by, you know, all races. From the Democratic German Report of April 23rd, 1975. This article is based upon material provided by GDR writer Julius Mader, who specializes in research into the Nazi period. Mildred Harnack was attached to the faculty for foreign studies at the Berliner University since 1949, the Humboldt University. The faculty was headed by Professor Franz Six, an SS Colonel. SS Colonel Six was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment for mass murder by a United States military court soon after the war. He was released in 1952. Despite the difficulty, Mildred Harnack managed to set up an anti-Nazi resistance group in the faculty, right under the nose of the SS Colonel. But all the time, the Gestapo had been getting closer. On September the 7th, 1942, Mildred and Arvid Harnack were arrested and charged with high treason. 
On December 19, 1942, Arvid Harnack and a number of his closest collaborators were sentenced to death by the Reich Military Court. Arvid Harnack was beheaded on December 22nd. In the same trial, Mildred Harnack was sentenced to six years imprisonment. Hitler personally intervened and insisted on a death sentence. The court was resummoned on January 13, 1943, and Mildred Harnack was sentenced to death. She was executed by the Axe in Plotzensee Prison. Berlin on February 16th, 1943. While she was awaiting execution, she translated into English one of the most famous poems by Goethe, which begins with the lines, Edel sei der Mensch, Hufreich und Gut. Here is Mildred Harnack's translation of the last verse of the poem, a translation made in the death cell. Man alone can do the impossible. He can distinguish, choose, and judge. He can make permanent the fleeing moment. In 1969, the Soviet government awarded decorations, most of them posthumous, to members of the Schultz Boysen Harnack organization, generally known by the nickname Red Orchestra. Mildred Harnack was awarded the Order of the Patriotic War First Class, and her husband, the Order of the Red Banner, Mildred Harnack Fish. Сам президент признал, Герцер признал, вся Америка признала, что да. To the Soviets, at the height of the Cold War. Ralph Bunch was simply a tool of the West. In this fight to clean out the disloyal people, the bad security risks from the State Department. To some Americans, on the other hand, he was an undercover agent for the Soviets. And the last thing we have to do is to build a power base so strong in this country that will bring them to their knees. During the turbulent 60s, some militant black Americans saw him as an international Uncle Tom. But to the vast majority of his fellow citizens of all colors, Bunch was nothing less than the ultimate model Negro. The person behind the image projected by the media of the day was far more complex and fascinating than even Bunch himself cared to reveal. Even today, he remains an enigma in American and world history. Bunch may have symbolized world peace and intergroup harmony, but he was no stranger to conflict and controversy. Today, across the street from the United Nations headquarters in New York, in a pocket-sized park, a towering monument celebrates the work of Ralph Bunch. Peace Form One. In 1949, 
Ralph Johnson Bunch, an African-American mediator, successfully negotiates an armistice agreement between Israel and four Arab nations, Transjordan, Lebanon, Egypt, and Syria. The only time in the long history of the Arab-Israeli conflict that all four Arab nations signed a peace treaty with Israel. Throughout the world, there is great hope for lasting peace in the Holy Land. For this unprecedented feat, Ralph Bunch is awarded a Nobel Prize for Peace and is catapulted into worldwide celebrity. Less well-known, but more significant and longer-lasting is the role he played behind the scenes in the historic struggle for self-determination after World War II, a struggle in which over a billion people of color gained national independence. How did a black man in America in the 1950s attain such an important level of influence in global affairs? We ran a story uh, in Ebony saying that Raft Bunch was the most honored uh, black man. We said Negro, the only, most honored black man in the world. I think he was the first black man to become a crossover in something other than entertainment. We probably have a bigger file on Raft Bunch than we have on Michael Jackson. <laughs> and back in New York, a testimonial dinner is given for Dr. Ralph Bunch, United Nations mediator in Palestine. Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt is among the hundreds who pay tribute to his efforts in bringing about the truce in the Holy Land. Here was a problem which ran the full gamut. Racial and religious antagonisms, political and economic conflict, foreign influences, international concern, and finally armed hostilities. And in this regard, as an American and a Negro, I cannot avoid reminding my fellow Americans that all of us who have a sense of justice and fair play must contribute to the solution of a problem on our own doorstep, which is perhaps more complex and baffling even than the Palestine problem. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences presents its annual awards for film merit. Jimmy Stewart, Jane Wyman on hand with Dr. Bunch of the United Nations. Dr. Ralph Bunch of the UN presents the Best Picture Oscar to Daryl Zanuck for All About Eve. For mediating the Palestine War, Dr. Ralph Bunch, American Negro attached to the United Nations, shown here with his family, is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Daddy, here's something I've made for you. Oh, uh, thanks very much, Ralph. This is very nice. Uh, of all the congratulatory messages we've, rec we've received, uh, this is the very best. I think uh, we should have it framed, don't you? Yes. His life is, is tailor-made for myth. It came along at a time in which his story was profoundly needed. I mean, a lot of people talk about Ralph Bunch as a role model for African Americans. That's true, but he's also a role model for white Americans who need some very basic lessons in human relations. Bunch's acceptance of the Nobel Prize for Peace is in 1950, when the Korean War had just broken up. The attack by the North Korean communists came suddenly and without warning. Korean Republican troops were thrown against the invaders south of the 38th parallel. At home, the war fuels growing fears of a communist conspiracy against the United States. It also hardens antagonisms between the power blocks of East and West. Any member of the party who has the guts to stand up and say, I am a communist, and then let him preach his doctrine if he may. And tell us when you join the party. Joseph I McCarthy, an ambitious junior senator from Wisconsin, is building a reputation for himself throughout America as a militant anti-communist. The United Nations becomes a hunting ground for the McCarthyites. High on the list of suspects, a Nobel Peace Prize winner and the director of the United Nations Trusteeship Division, Dr. Ralph Johnson Bunch. 
Well, yeah, it's ironic. At the same time, he's getting all of these international awards and sort of being pushed as uh, the uh, the American solution to the communist claim that blacks are being oppressed in the United States. Well, how can they be oppressed? Here's Ralph Bunch. At the same time this is going on, Eisenhower is inviting him to the White House to dinners and so forth. The, the Congress and the FBI are investigating him. I think Bunch finds out that the stuff that he's involved with in 1935, 36, potentially ruins his career in the mid-50s. Um, during the 35 and 36 years, he was at his most radical, I'd say, and organizing and affiliating with most openly communist and Marxist parties and such. And um, it came back to haunt him. Ralph Johnson Bunch was the eldest child of Fred Bunch and Olive Johnson Bunch. He grew up in Detroit in a wooden frame house on Anthon Street. Ralph was surrounded by devoted uncles and aunts. Mrs. Johnson, the family matriarch, was known affectionately as Nana, the name young Ralph gave his grandmother. Bunch writes, My childhood days were poor days, but happy ones. I used to trot behind the street bands, the German bands, the thrill of the circus parade when Barnum and Bailey came to town, and the still bigger thrill of slipping into the big tent under the canvas sides. <laughs> he grew up in interracial neighborhoods. In Detroit, the children who suffered the most prejudice were Italian children who had immigrated, and the Austro-Hungarians were very mean to them, apparently, and would throw snowballs filled with, with coal pieces in the middle at them. Ralph did it once, and he realized it wasn't right. Came home and told Nana, and she said, oh, you have no right to do that to anybody, and set him straight about that. The political education of Ralph Bunch began with the First World War. Like many young Americans growing up in the post-war world, Ralph Bunch is enthusiastic about President Woodrow Wilson's idea of a League of Nations that will ensure peace and democracy throughout the world. But as an African American, he is also aware of the contradictions, the injustices he sees here at home. James Weldon Johnson who by this time is executive secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of the Colored People, calls the summer of 1919 the Red Summer, not because of the, uh, of the rise of, of, of communism and the red government in, in, uh, in Moscow, but because the streets uh, in this country are flowing with the blood of blacks, uh, thanks to the, no, to the large number of racial riots that are going on. And I have no doubt that uh, Ralph himself would have become aware of some of these developments uh, through people like W.E.B. Du Bois in New York, Monroe Trotter in Boston, Ada Wells in Chicago, and uh, a whole group of people uh, became vocal. By 1922, Ralph's family had moved to Los Angeles. A popular young man who earns the highest grades in his class, he is ready to graduate from Thomas Jefferson High School. It is assumed that Ralph will represent Jefferson High in the Ephebian Society, the citywide special honors society for the best scholastic achievers in Los Angeles. But when the list of honorees is published in 1922, the name Ralph Bunch is not on that list. Hurt and angry, Ralph wants to drop out of school, but standing in his way is his grandmother, Mrs. Lucy Taylor Johnson. 
she was a very gentle lady and she never raised her voice, but she was very strong. Nana tells Ralph, Always protect your self-respect and your dignity. Never pick a fight, but never run away from one either if your dignity or an important principle is involved. Let no one ever lower rate you. Ralph realizes he can do quite well without the honor. He graduates first in his class, is chosen valedictorian, wins a scholarship to UCLA for achievement in sports. The night that he graduated in 1922, my grandmother was with him at the reception. And the principal approached them and said, oh, Mrs. Johnson, we're so proud of Ralph. You know, we've never even thought of him as a Negro. He's so outstanding. Well, that was absolutely the wrong thing to say to my grandmother because she dressed that principal down so that he turned very, very red, I understand. Bunch writes, Nana could be regarded as an optional Negro. She was entirely Caucasian in appearance. Her twin brother, in fact, passed over into the white sector as a youth. White as Nana was outside, she was all black pride and fervor inside. Everyone in our clan got the race pride message very early in life. It has stuck with me. Whatever may be the attitude of you older people toward this dastardly practice of insolently slapping the race in the face, I want to tell you that when I think of such outrageous atrocities, my blood boils. 1927, Ralph's senior year at UCLA. He speaks to a black community group regarding a recently segregated swimming pool in South Central Los Angeles. Any Los Angeles Negro who would go bathing in that dirty hole with that sign, for colored only, gawking down at him in insolent mockery of his race, is either a fool or a traitor to his kind. In and out of school, I have always been motivated by a spirit of competition, particularly when pitted against white people. I suppose this is an inevitable response to Nana's constant admonition to let them, especially white folks, know that you can do anything they can do. Uh, he was extremely competitive, just felt that uh, he could do as well, if not better, than his contemporaries and proposed to do so. And I think that followed on in later life. I think his persistence as a negotiator, for example, came from the idea that he, there was not either a person or a problem which was going to do Ralph Bunch in if he could possibly help it. While Los Angeles has its share of prejudice and discrimination, there is less prejudice and segregation here than in other parts of the country. Years later, Ralph would say, UCLA is where it all began for me. On and off campus, he often speaks to black and white groups on topics that include the subject of interracial harmony and cooperation. May 1927, Ralph graduates from UCLA, summa cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa. He delivers the class valedictory address, an address he calls the fourth dimension of personality. Man professes strict moral codes, promulgates them through great educational systems, and solidifies them in law. But invariably, his subsequent deeds belie and pervert his original intent. Man learns and knows, but he does not do as well as he knows. This is his weakness. The future peace and harmony of the world are contingent upon the ability, yours and mine, to effect a remedy. In that fourth dimension speech, he says, we need not be less intellectual. We need be more spiritual. We need not think less. We need to feel more. When you look at the text of this, I think it really influenced the way in which he conducted his entire service at the United Nations. Ralph wins a scholarship to do graduate work at Harvard University. But even with the scholarship, there isn't any money for living expenses. Then out of the blue, a local black women's club comes to the rescue. The ladies of the Iroquois Friday Morning Club of Los Angeles is glad to help this worthy young man financially that he may be unhampered in his first year at Harvard. 
Ralph has officially joined what W.E.B. Du Bois calls the talented 10th of black America. He writes to Dr. Du Bois, the editor of The Crisis, the NAACP magazine. Dear Dr. Du Bois, I have long felt the need of coming in closer contact with the leaders of our race so that I may better learn their methods of approach, their psychology, and benefit in my own development by their influence. That is why I'm anxious to come east. I would like to inquire if there's any way that I can be of service to my group this coming summer. Almost immediately we have in an issue of the crisis a, a notation that this brilliant young man, Phi Beta Kappa, UCLA, has uh, graduated and is now uh, going to Harvard for his, uh, his doctorate in clinical science. His career is tracked. He becomes a personality to, to be monitored. Graduation time, Harvard University. At 25 years of age, Bunch receives a Master of Arts degree in political science and is offered the Thayer Fellowship to pursue further studies in the field, an offer he declines. Instead, he takes a job at Howard University in Washington, D.C., the premier black institution of higher learning in the country where he has been invited to teach, reorganize, and expand the political science department. As a teacher, Bunch is following in the footsteps of his maternal grandfather, Thomas Nelson Johnson. Johnson, a college graduate, had dedicated himself to the education of freedmen and women after the Civil War. One of his first students was Bunch's grandmother, Lucy Taylor, a young freed woman whom Johnson later married. Ralph also falls in love with one of his students. Ruth Ethel Harris had recently moved with her family to Washington, D.C. from Alabama. She teaches school in the daytime and takes courses at Howard University at night. One of these is a course in political science taught by a handsome young professor named Ralph Bunch. They marry on June 23, 1930, in the midst of the Depression. Their first child, Joan, is born in December 1931. Mr. Bunch was clearly a faculty leader. As a teacher at Howard University, he said to all of us, yes, of course, I want you to have distinguished careers in whatever fields you're following. But I want you never to forget, it's very important, never forget that you owe something to your people. By the 1920s, the nation's capital, in the wake of President Woodrow Wilson's racial policies, had evolved into a fully segregated town. By 1925, just two years before Ralph Bunch moves to Washington, the Ku Klux Klan is sufficiently well established in the capital to parade down Pennsylvania Avenue to cheering crowds. 